on land, he was forced to carry heavy burdens. On sea, he was chained to an oar and made to row as a galley slave. At last, coming to a strange shore, the Tartars took the Jew into the city and sold him in the marketplace as a slave. He was purchased by the king's grand vizier, who soon perceived that the slave, though of a race unknown to him, was a person of unusual intelligence. Rabbi Elazar had kept count of the days. When Sabbath came, he begged his master to permit him to. He. 5. Rest on that day. This the vizier granted, and Rabbi Elazar did not work on Sabbath. The only duty of Rabbi Elazar, when he was a slave, was to watch for the time when his master the vizier returned from his audience with the king. Then Rabbi Elazar would wash the feet of the grand vizier. Thus, the slave had a great deal of time to pass. Rabbi Elazar knew by heart the songs of David, and he passed his days singing the songs. He was not happy, for he felt himself alone away from his people, and he prayed God that he might be released to go home to his wife and to live among other Jews. At last he could bear his life in the port no longer, and he thought of flight. One night he crept from his bed and made his way through the halls of the palace, until he reached the gate. There he saw the guard asleep. His naked sword, fallen from his hand, lay at his side. The keys were bound to his girdle. Rabbi Elazar looked at the sword and said to himself, To take the keys I must lift the sword and slay the man. Instead, he returned and remained in captivity. One year, the king besieged a neighboring city. The city was strong and withstood his attack. Then the king did not know what to do. He asked of his advisors whether his army should continue to stand in their boats on the river before the walls of the city, becoming themselves weaker while they waited for the enemy to weaken, or whether he should risk all of his men in a charge upon the walls. P. 6. The vizier did not know what advice to give, and fell therefore into disfavor with the king. When the vizier came home, Elazar saw that he was troubled. He began, as every day, to wash his master's feet. The vizier sighed and said, Would that my own task were so simple. And then, out of the heaviness of his heart, he talked to his slave and told him of the problem that was before the king. Rabbi Elazar said, Perhaps God will show me a way to help the king. Take me to the king tomorrow. That night the Rabbi Elazar prayed to God. And he had a dream. In the dream he saw the walls of the neighboring city, and the river that flowed before them. At the edge of the river he saw a great stone, round as the earth. The stone moved, and rolled into the water. Where the stone had been, there was a hole. In the morning Elazar said, Let the king take me aboard his ship, and I will show him what he must do. The vizier told the king of the request to his slave. He comes from a far land, and is a wise man among his own people, said the vizier. Is he a sorcerer? said the king. He prays constantly to his god. Let him be brought before me, said the king. When he was brought before the king, Elazar said, It is natural that you should doubt my wisdom, for I am only an unknown slave. I say to you that the enemy army is strong, and will destroy your army if you attack the walls of the city. If you would test. P. 7. My words, take from your galleys men who are already condemned to death, and put them in the first boat, and send them to attack the walls of the city. The king did as Rabbi Elazar advised. Convicts were chosen, and sent against the enemy. No sooner had they neared the wall than their boat was overwhelmed with a swarm of arrows, spears, and darts of fire. Every man of them was instantly killed. The king despaired, and cried, What is there for me to do? Wait until night, said Elzer. In the night, he guided the ship of the king through darkness across the water to a spot at the edge of the river where they found a great rock. This rock they rolled away, and the mouth of the tunnel was revealed. Rabbi Elazar took a candle in his hand, and crept into the tunnel, and after him, one by one, came soldiers. Silently and slowly they went along the narrow, tortuous passage that was hewn through stone and digged through earth. At last they came up within the walls of the city. Thus a great army came up into the city, and attacked the enemies, and overthrew them. When the king had captured the city he said to Rabbi Elazar, I will give you my daughter as your wife, and I will make you the highest man in the kingdom, after the king. He placed Elazar in a palace, and sent him slaves and riches. The princess who was given to him was beautiful and young. But the rabbi remembered that he was already married. One morning when he sat at table with the princess. P. 8. She asked of him, Why is it that you are not with me as a husband is with his wife? Then Elazar said, If you will promise not to reveal my secret, I will tell you. She promised not to betray him, and then he told her that he was a Jew, and he told her of all the things that had befallen him. Because the princess loved Rabbi Elazar, she took all of her jewels, and all of the gold that she possessed, and loaded a ship with her treasures. Then she said to Rabbi Elazar, Go on the ship, and find your way home. He was joyous. Day and night he sang his praises to the heavens. But on the sea the king's ships overtook him. Rabbi Elazar cried, Take the treasures from me, all the jewels and the gold. Leave me only with my God. He will guide me home. Just then, God looked over all the earth, 
saying, Where shall a man and woman be found who are worthy of bringing into the world an uncontaminated soul, the soul of Rabbi Israel? Elijah said to God, There is Rabbi Elzer, alone on the sea. He is worthy of being the father of such a son. In a village in Moldau, his wife has waited for him for 17 years. God called to the soul of Rabbi Israel, and showed him his father. Rabbi Elzer wandered homeward. He was naked and hungry. P. 9. On a path in the forest Elijah met him and said, A son will be born to you who will be a light to all Israel. In the little city of Ophir, beneath the mountains, Rabbi Elzer found his wife. Nine months after his return, she bore him a son, and they named the child Israel. When the child had been circumcised, the mother died. The Golden Mountain, by Mayor Levin, 1932, at Sacred Texts. Com. P. 10. Israel and the Enemy. A strange tale, filled with hidden meaning, telling how Israel held in his hand the heart that was the kernel of darkness. When Israel was five years old, his father Eleazar was dying. On the day of his death Rabbi Eleazar talked to his son. Eleazar was old, and the wandering that he had done over the earth had creased his body with pain. His eyes were weary, for they had stared many days upon the clouds to see one instant of heaven. And now he was glad that his death was come. He said to the boy, My child, know that the enemy will always be with you, he will be in the shadows of your dreams and in your living flesh, for he is the other part of yourself. There will be times when like a lightning stroke you will pierce into his farthest hiding place, and he will fade before you like a fleeing cloud. And there will be times when he will surround you with claws of darkness, and you will stand alone as upon a raft in the midst of a sea of night. But remember always that your soul is secure to you, for your soul is entire, and he cannot come into it. Your soul is a part of God. Before you were born it was made known to me that God would always be with you, for within you there lives one of the innocent souls of heaven. Then go fearless through your life on earth, do not be afraid of man, and do not fear the enemy, for the highest power is in you. P. 11. After the death of Rabbi Eliezer, the Jews of the village cared for his child. Israel was sent to the Cheddar. But soon he found he could not bear to remain within the schoolroom. He would glide through the door and go into the woods, there he would remain all day long, walking under the trees, sitting among the flowers, or by the running river, absorbed with joy. The schoolmaster would find him and take him back to the Cheddar. For a few days Israel would attend dutifully, but then again an urge would come into him, and he would run to the woods. At last the schoolmaster lost patience with the boy, and left him to do as he pleased. Then Israel lived joyously, he was brisk as a squirrel. He made himself a mossy place within a cave, and there he slept, or he slept in the branches of the trees. He lived on berries and fruit, he talked with the birds, he played with the untamed beasts, and sometimes he stood very still, and listened. So Israel grew. When he was ten years old he came out of the woods to the village of Mordenka, and became a helper to the schoolmaster there. It was Israel's duty to go from one house to another early every morning, to wake the children and lead them to the cheddar. In the evening he led them home. Soon the Jews of Hordenka began to feel that the children were changed. They were like no other Jewish children. Often, they sang. And this is how it happened that the children of Hordenka sang. At dawn, the boy Israel went from house to house, calling to his followers. When he had gathered all his p. 12. Heard, he would lead them toward the fields, quite in the opposite way from the cheddar. And then he would begin to sing. And the other children would also begin to sing. So they would go a long way through the fields and through the woods, going in a great circle until they came to the schoolhouse. In the late afternoon he would lead them again singing through the woods and the fields, they would come carrying green branches in their hands, with flowers woven in their hair. Often they sang, Praised be his holy name, Amen. For Israel knew no other song. The voices of the singing children rose like arrows upward and broke against the heavy clouds of evil that the enemy had spread over the earth. Each day the voices beat against the clouds, until they pierced into them. Soon a crack was made, and the voices reached the blue sky, and flew toward heaven. Then the exiled and wandering spirit called the Shekinah, hearing the singing of the children, raised her head in the hope that the time had come when she might flow back into her creator, and again be one with him. But Satan rose in furious hate and strode straight into heaven. Someone there below is interfering with my work. He cried. Elijah said, it is only a band of children singing. Let me strive against the children. Satan demanded of God. And God nodded his head, saying, strive. Then Satan went down to the earth. He went to the wood where the boy Israel had. P. 13. Lived, there the enemy crept over the ground, peering at every insect and crawling into the bosom of every flower. Of insect and blossom he asked, Will you carry my poison into the heart of the child Israel? But no living thing would turn against the child. In that wood lived an aged charcoal burner, who had been born without a human soul. His body lived, and ate, and slept. He did not know what was right and what was wrong. 
He was afraid of humans, and therefore hid himself in the forest. Some people thought he was a sorcerer, and they feared him. It was true that often at night a demoniac power would creep into the flesh of the old charcoal burner. Then he would feel himself becoming an animal. He would crouch, and sink onto his forepaws. His limbs would become covered with fur. Then he would be a werewolf, and prowl under the trees. Those who went late into the woods were often frightened by the werewolf's moan. But none had felt his teeth. The charcoal burner's simple heart shrank under the terrible urge that made him into werewolf. When he had howled his pain and shame, he would creep under a bush and lie there panting, unable to flee his self, until at last he slept. So the enemy found him sleeping. Satan reached his hand into the breast of the sleeping creature, and took his heart out from his body. That heart Satan buried in the earth. And within the breast of the human werewolf he placed his own heart, that was the innermost kernel of darkness. When Israel came at dawn with his singing children. P. 14. Tar the forest, the werewolf broke from the bush and rushed with snorting nostrils and teeth that flashed like knives toward the flock of children. The children screamed in fright, some fell insensible, some ran into the forest, some into the field, some clung to each other and cried, and some were taken with fever. The werewolf disappeared. Israel called to the boys who had been with him, but they were run home crying. Then the whole village was taken with fright. The children told of the terrifying wolf that had come out of the forest upon them, they shivered and whimpered and trembled, and some lay in their houses, sick with fright. The mothers and fathers said, it is the fault of the boy who led them into the forest. We will not send the children with him anymore. When the other boys had run to their mothers and fathers, Israel went into the forest. He thought of the words his father had spoken to him, and he knew that what the other children feared, he need not fear. He walked all morning in the forest. Then he returned to the village, and went from one house to the other, speaking to the parents of the children. Let them come out with me again, he said. No harm will befall them. A wolf ran by in the field, he was himself frightened of the children. Let them come with me again tomorrow, and you will see how they will no longer be frightened. And the eyes of the boy were so earnest, and his. P. 15. Pleading was so strong, that the parents trusted him and said, come for the children in the morning. At dawn of the next day Israel once more gathered his band about him. He spoke to them earnestly of many things, as a man speaks to his fellows. Come behind me, he said, and whatever happens, do not be taken with fright, do not run. Then he began to sing, and the children followed him singing Yiskidol. He led them across the fields, to the very edge of the wood. There he stopped and said, remain here. He went alone into the forest. At once the beast emerged from behind the trees, and came toward Israel. The boy saw the beast becoming larger, he saw the beast grow until his back was a scowling cloud arched beneath the heavens, and his paws clutched the horror, and the bloody vapor that issued from his mouth covered the rising sun. But the boy was not afraid. He walked straight forward, going into the very body of the werewolf, and nothing stopped his steps. He came to the dark glowing heart of the beast. Round and shining like a black mirror it lay before him. All of the knowledge and all of the desire of the world were drawn into its gloomy depth, and all of the evil and all of the untruth in the world were reflected outward from its surface, reflected with such a black and universal brilliance of hatred that only his universal love of God saved the boy from being blinded, and drawn into the mirror, to become a part of its evil. That black heart was given into his hand. P. 16. He closed his fingers tightly over it, he held it fast. But then he felt it palpitating within his hand, shivering and jerking like a fish out of water, he felt the blood drop from it, and he knew the immeasurable pain that was in that heart, pain that began before time began, and would endure forever. Then he took pity, and gave freedom to the heart. He placed it upon the earth. And the earth opened and swallowed the black heart into itself. Israel looked around, and saw that he was alone. He went and found his band of children and led them on to the cheddar. At the close of the day, townsfolk found the charcoal burner lying dead under the bushes in the woods. A smile of simple innocence was on his face. His eyes were closed. Then, they did not understand why they had ever feared him, saying he became a werewolf at night in the woods. For in death he was like a child. From that day forward the children of Kordenka ceased to sing as they went after Israel through the fields. They began to be like their fathers, and the fathers of their fathers, with their heads bowed between their shoulders. The Golden Mountain, by Mayor Levin, 1932, at Sacred Texts. Com. P. 17. The Book of Mysteries. In this story we learn how the Baal Shem Tov received the Book of Adam, and of the frightful end that came to the son of Rabbi Adam. When the children of Kordenka ceased to sing, Israel was no longer content to remain in the place. He wandered again, and returned to the town of Ophir, where he had been born. There he became the watcher of the synagogue. The desire for knowledge came into him. And the joy that was given him by flowers and beasts in the forest was no longer sufficient. 
His mind was afire and thirsty, but his thirst could be quenched only by those waters that had cooled for ages deep in the deepest wells of mystery, and the fire within him was of the sort that burns forever, and does not consume. The innermost secrets of the Cabalo were for him, and they were only as stars of night against the sun. For to him would be revealed the secret of secrets. The boy lived in the synagogue. But since the time for the revelation of his power was yet far away, he did not show his passion for the Torah to the men of the synagogue. By day, he slept on the benches, pretending to be a god. But as soon as the last of the scholars blew out his candle and crept on his way toward home, Israel rose, and took the candle into a corner, and lighted it, and all night long he stood and read the Torah. In another city the Tzaddik Rabbi Adam, master of all mysteries, waited the coming of his last day. 4. P. 18. In each generation one is chosen to carry throughout his lifetime the candle that is lighted from heaven. And the candle may never be set down. And the soul of the Tzaddik may not return to eternal peace in the regions above until another such soul illuminates the earth. Rabbi Adam was even greater than the Tzaddik who had been before him. For in the possession of Rabbi Adam was the book that contains the word of eternal light. Though Rabbi Adam was not one of the innocent souls, he had led a life so pure that this book had been given into his hands. Before him, only six human beings had possessed the knowledge that was in the book of Adam. The book was given to the first man, Adam, and it was given to Abraham, to Joseph, to Joshua ben Nun, and to Solomon. And the seventh to whom it was given was the Tzaddik, Rabbi Adam. This is how he came to receive the book. When he had learned all Torah, and all Kabbalah, he had not been content, but had searched day and night for the innermost secret of power. When he knew all the learning that there was among men, he said, man does not know. And he had begged of the angels. One night Rabbi Adam arose from his sleep. He walked into a wilderness. Before him stood a mountain, and in the side of the mountain was a cave. And that was one mouth of the cave, whose other mouth was in the Holy Land. It was the cave of the Mikla, where Abraham lies buried. Rabbi Adam went deep into the cave, and there he found the book. P. 19. All of his life Rabbi Adam has guarded the secret of knowledge. Gazing into it, he had grown old, and he had come to see with the grave eyes of one who sees to the end of things. And when he saw himself growing old, he began to ask, What will become of my wisdom? Then he rose, and looked to the Lord and said, To whom, Almighty God, shall I leave the book of wisdom? Give me a son, that I may teach him. He was given a son. His son grew, and became learned in the Torah. The rabbi taught his son all that there was in the Torah. And he said, My son learns well. He began to teach his son the Kabbalah. His son was sharp in understanding. But when the boy had learned the secrets of the Kabbalah, he asked no more. Then the old heart of Rabbi Adam was weary and yearned for death. My son is not the one, he said. Night after night Rabbi Adam prayed to the Almighty that he might be relieved of the burden of knowledge. And one night the word came to him, saying, Give the book into the hands of Rabbi Israel, son of Eliezer, who lives in Okip. Rabbi Adam was thankful, for now he might give over his burden, and die. He said to his son, Here is one book in which I have not read with you. His son asked, Was I not worthy? You are not the predestined vessel, said Rabbi Adam. You would break with the heat of the fluid. Then he said to his son, Seek out Rabbi Israel, in the city of Okab, for these leaves belong to him. And if he will be favorable toward you and receive you as his servant and instruct you in his Torah, then... P. 20. Count yourself happy. 4. My son, you must know that it is your fate to be the squire who gives into the hands of his knight the sword that has been tempered and sharpened by hundreds of divine spirits that now lie silent under the earth. Soon Rabbi Adam died. His son did not think of himself, but thought only of fulfilling the mission his father had given into his charge. He deserted the city of his birth and, taking with him the leaves of the book, went in search of that Rabbi Israel of whom his father had spoken. The son of Rabbi Adam came to the town of Okib. He wished to keep secret the true reason of his coming, so he said, I am seeking a bride. I would marry, and live my life here. The people of the town were delighted, and felt greatly honored because the son of the Tzaddik, Rabbi Adam, had chosen to live among them. Every day he went to the synagogue. There he encountered scholars, and holy men, and rabbis. He asked their names of them. But he did not meet with anyone called Rabbi Israel, son of Rabbi Elzer. Often, when all the others had gone from the synagogue, Rabbi Adam's son remained studying the Torah. Then he noticed that the boy who served in the synagogue also remained there. He saw that the eyes of the boy were bright with inner knowledge, and that his face was strained with unworldly happiness. Rabbi Adam's son went to the elders of their house of prayer and said to them, Let me have a separate room in which to study. Perhaps I shall want to sleep. P. 21. There are sometimes when I study late into the night. Then give me the boy Israel as a servant. Why has he chosen the boy Israel, who was a god? The elders asked. Then they remembered that Israel was the son of Rabbi Elzer. 
he has chosen him to honor the memory of his father, Eliezer, who was a very holy man, they said. When the boy came to serve him, the son of Rabbi Adam asked, What is your name? Israel, son of Eliezer. The master watched the boy, and soon came to feel certain that this was indeed the Rabbi Israel whom he sought. One night he remained late in the synagogue. He lay down on a bench, and pretended to be asleep. He opened his eyes a little, and he saw how the boy Israel arose and took a candle and lighted it, and covered the light, standing in a corner and studying the Torah. For many hours the boy remained motionless in an intensity of study that the rabbi had known only in his father, the tzaddik rabbi Adam. All night long the boy studied. And when the sunrise embraced his candle flame, he slipped down upon the bench, and slept. Then the rabbi arose and took a leaf from the holy book his father had given him, and placed the leaf on the breast of Israel. Soon the boy stirred, and sleeping reached his hand toward the page of writing. He held the page before his eyes, and opened his eyes and read. As he read, he rose. He bent over the page of mysteries, and studied it, and his whole face was aflame, his eyes. P. 22. Load as if they had pierced into the heart of the earth, and his hands burned as if they lay against the heart of the earth. When full day came, the boy fell powerless upon the bench, and slept. The rabbi sat by him and watched over him until he awoke again. Then the rabbi placed his hand upon the boy's hand that held the leaf out of the book. The rabbi took the other pages of the book, and gave them to him, saying, Know, that I place in your hands the infinite wisdom that God gave forth on Mount Sinai. The words that are in this book have been entrusted only in the hearts of the chosen of the chosen, when no soul on earth was worthy to contain its wisdom. This book lay hidden from man. For centuries it was buried in unreachable depths. But always there came the time for its uncovering, again it was brought to light, again lost. My father was the last of the great souls to whom it was entrusted. I was not found worthy of retaining it, and through my hands my father transmits this book to your hands. I beg of you, Rabbi Israel, allow me to be your servant, let me be as the heir about you, absorbing your holy words, that otherwise would be lost in nothingness. Israel answered, let it be so. We will go out of the city, and give ourselves over to the study of this book. The son of Rabbi Adam went with Israel to live in a house that stood outside of the town. There, day and night, they were absorbed in the study of the pages that contained the words of all the mysteries. P. 23. Click to enlarge the book of mysteries. P. 24. Israel was as one who feeds on honey and walks on golden clouds. His soul swelled with tranquil joy, and his heart was filled with a piece of understanding. Often, he went with the leaves of the book into the forest, and there, the words of the book were as the words spoken to him by the flowers and by the beasts. But the son of Rabbi Adam was eaten by that upon which he fed, and yet his hunger grew ever more insatiable. The grander the visions that opened before him, the greater was the cavern within himself. And he was afraid, as one who stands on a great height and looks downward. Each day, his eyes sank deeper, and became more red. Rabbi Israel, seeing the illness that was come into his companion, said to him, What is it that consumes you? What is it that you desire? Then the son of Rabbi Adam said, Only one thing can give me rest. All that has been revealed to me has set me flaming with a single curiosity, and each new mystery that is solved before me only causes a greater chaos in my mind, and a greater hunger in my heart. What is the one thing that you desire? Reveal the word to me. The word is inviolate. Cried Rabbi Israel. But the son of Rabbi Adam fell on his knees and cried, Until I see the end of all wisdom, I cannot come to rest. Call down the highest of powers, the giver of the Torah himself, force him to come down to us, otherwise I am lost. P. 25. Then the master shrank from him. He said, The hour has not yet come for his descent to earth. His companion was silent. He never pleaded with Israel again. But each day Rabbi Israel saw his face become darker, and his body become more feeble. The hands were weak, and could hardly turn a leaf. Rabbi Israel was torn with pity for his companion. At last he said, Is it still your wish that we name the giver of the Torah, and call him to earth once more? The son of Rabbi Adam remained silent. But he lifted his eyes to the eyes of Rabbi Israel. They were as the eyes of the dead come to life. Then we must purify our souls, that they may reach the uttermost power of will. On Friday, the two rabbis went to the Nikki, where they bathed in the spring of holy water. From Sabbath to Sabbath they fasted, and when they reached the height of their fast they went again to the Miku, and purified themselves in the bath. On the second Friday night they stood in their house of prayer. They called upon their own souls and said, Are you pure? Their souls answered, We have been purified. Then Rabbi Israel raised his hands into the darkness, and cried out the terrible name. The son of Rabbi Adam raised his arms aloft, and his feeble lips moved as he repeated the unknowable word. But in the instant that the word left those lips, Israel touched him and said, My brother, you have made. P. 26. An error. 
Your command was wrongly uttered. It has been caught by the wind. It has been carried to the Lord of Fire. We are in the hands of death. I am lost, said the son of Rabbi Adam, for I am not pure. Only one way is left to us, cried Rabbi Israel. We must watch until day comes. If one of us closes an eyelid, the evil one will seize him, he is lost. Then they began to watch. They stood guard over their souls. With their eyes open they watched. And the hours passed. They stood in prayer, and the hours passed. But as dawn came, the son of Rabbi Adam, enfeebled by his week of purification, and by the long struggle against the darkness of night, wavered, his head nodded, and sank upon the table. Rabbi Israel reached out his arm to raise him. But in that moment an unseen thing sped from the mouth of Rabbi Adam's son, and a flame devoured his heart, and his body sank to the ground. The Golden Mountain, by Mayor Levin, 1932, at Sacred Texts. Com. P. 27. The Secret Marriage. Here are told the marvelous deeds of Rabbi Israel while he was still a saint in secret. After the death of his companion, the master forsook the house where they had lived and studied together. Israel returned into the forest. There, for the length of a day, he sat by a stream and watched the flowing water. And he said to himself, Shall I go among men, or shall I remain in the forest? He thought, For what purpose shall I go among men? I am the master of all knowledge. There is nothing that I can learn among men. He built himself a cottage, and he lived in the forest. Yet he knew that he must go among men and help them. For what else might be done with the power that had been given him? Mankind will contaminate the truth, he said. Let me remain a while longer where I am and he waited for a sign. Near the forest was a field where a shepherd came every day to pasture his flock of sheep. The shepherd was an aged Jew. He came to know the young man who lived in the woods. One day he said to him, Why do you live by yourself? I have a daughter, I will give her to you for a wife. Then Rabbi Israel was married to the shepherd's daughter. For a year's time he lived in the forest with her together, and in that time Rabbi Israel was P. 28. Happy on earth. He thought, perhaps I shall not ever have to return among men. But when the year was over his young wife died. Rabbi Israel got up and went out of the forest. In the city of Brody was a yeshiva where many scholars sat learning. He went to a hamlet near Brody, and he took work as a school teacher, and he lived in the house of Rabbi Chaim. He did not let it be seen that he was a tzaddik. But Rabbi Chaim's wife, Rebetzin, was the sister of the great Gion Meher. And she saw that there was a strangeness in the face of the school teacher who lived in her house. Then a thing happened that made her suspect he was a saint in hiding. There was no place for Israel to sleep in that house except a small room in the garret. For many years the garret had been troubled by restless spirits who came during the night and ran over the walls, hammering, and hurling themselves against the floor, and making weird sounds of moaning. Rabbi Chaim and all the people in his house were afraid to go up into that room. But Israel went there to sleep. The Rebetzin awoke during the night. She heard the weird moaning of the spirits. And all at once she heard the young man cry out, Be still. From then on, there were no more sounds in the garret. This, the Rebetzin remembered. It happened that while Israel lived in that house, Rabbi Chaim and Rabbi Hirsch had to decide the key. 29. Judgment of the Torah in a very difficult case. Rabbi Hirsch was the father of Rabbi Gershon of Kut. A man in the city of Kut had gone through Rabbi Chaim's hamlet, and he bought a horse. When I reach home, I will send you the money, and you will send me the horse, he said. And so he did. But when the horse came to him, it was lame. The seller said, the horse was well when it started to kuth. The buyer said, it was lame when it came. Then who was to bear the loss of the horse's lameness? The two rabbis talked for many hours, but could come to no understanding. At last Israel, who sat listening in the room, said, Did the horse draw a wagon on his way to Kuth? The man who had sold the horse said, He drew a wagon. What was on the wagon? It was loaded with logs. Then the logs belonged to the lameness, give the logs also to the buyer of the horse. Rabbi Hirsch was so pleased with the wisdom of this decision that he said to the young man, Who are you? I am a school teacher in this village. You are the man whom God intended as the husband of my daughter. I will give her to you in marriage and he sat down at once to write the marriage contract. But when Rabbi Hirsch asked of the master, P. 30. Paragraph continues. What is your name, Rabbi? The master said, Do not write down that I am a rabbi. Write only, Israel, son of Eliezer. On his way home, Rabbi Hirsch died. Afterwards Rabbi Gershon looked among the papers of his dead father, and there he found a marriage contract. Who is this Israel, son of Eliezer, to whom my sister is given in marriage? He asked, but no one knew who that might be. However, his sister said, My father made the contract, and I will wait until my groom comes to claim me. And still Israel did not go to claim the daughter of Rabbi Hirsch. 
but remained living in the house of Rabbi Chaim. Once the Rebetzin had to make a journey to the Lord of the district. The way to the house of the parrots led through a forest that was infested with robbers. The Rebetzin thought, whom shall I take with me to protect me from the robbers? And she decided that no one would be better than the young man Israel, so she asked him to go with her in her wagon. When they had come deep into the forest, Israel touched the Rebetzin's arm and said to her, soon we will be stopped by a robber. Do not be frightened. The woman felt that there was great power in the boy, but she did not know how truly great was his power. She said, I have no money to give the robber, and he will kill us. The robber who will stop our wagon is one who, P. 31, has murdered many people, said Israel. But his measure is full, he will murder no more. They rode on. The trees about them rose high, and the narrow road was a dark path under overhanging cliffs. It was dark as the inside of a cave. The Rebetzin said, you are only a young boy. Could you kill a robber with your hands? Israel said, I have the power of the word. All at once the horse stopped. The robber stood in front of them. He slapped the flat side of his sword against their legs. Jews. He shouted, get out of the wagon. Part with your money or your souls. We have no money, said Israel, and you have no need of our souls. At this reply the robber became black with anger. He seized the wheel as if he would wrench it from the wagon and break it over their heads. He began to mount the wagon. But before the robber could swing his foot upward, the Baal Shem Tov looked into his face and uttered a word. The bandit stood petrified. He could not move his limbs. But he still could move his mouth, and he filled the air with his vile curses, flinging his oaths like thunderbolts upon them. He cursed them, and their fathers, and the fathers of their fathers, he cursed their children, and all the generations of the Jews, and he cursed the rabbis, with the blackest and most terrible of curses. Cease your blasphemy, said Rabbi Israel. And he looked into the face of the robber, and once more he uttered a word. At once the ground opened beneath the bandit. He, 32, and he sank into the earth up to his knees. Then a wild shout of terror and of rage hurled itself out of his throat. And it was like the scream of iron grinding on iron. His arm, with the sword raised in the air, trembled like a beam that is strained to budge a heavy rock. The blood swelled in the veins of his face and of his arm. But with all his force he could not move his arm to hurl the sword at their heads. Then he burst out more loudly than ever with curses that were more foul than the stench of hell. Upon all the ancestors of the Jews he heaped his curses, and on Abraham, and on Isaac, and on Jacob, and upon the God of the Jews. Then it is time you were under the earth, said Israel. Once more he uttered a word, and the robber sank slowly into the earth, his thighs were covered, and his belly, and his chest, and his shoulders were below the ground. Then the earth closed over his throat and reached his chin, his cursing mouth was filled with earth and the earth was in his eyes, his head was below the ground, and his outstretched arm, and his sword. The Rebetzin and the boy rode on their way. When the wagon had passed out of the wood, Israel said to the Rebetzin, Now there is no more danger. I command you, do not tell any living soul what happened in the forest. You must not tell your husband, or your brother the Gion Meherim. It is not yet time for my power to be known. What will be my reward for keeping silence? Ask the Rebetzin. P. 33. You will have peace in your grave. For this, she agreed to keep silence. Rabbi Israel said, If ever you are disturbed in your grave, utter my name. Many years later, when the Rebetzin had long been dead, and Rabbi Israel was no longer a saint in secret, but was known among all Jewry as the holy man of Mejibaz, a plague came over that hamlet near Brody where the Rebetzin had lived and died. Almost half of the people of the village died, and still the plague continued, and every day the peasants died like fleas. Then the Christians looked toward the Jews and said, It is their doing. The peasants went to the priests and cried, Only Jewish blood will save us. But the priests held them back, saying, The Jews are not to blame. The Jews are also dying of the plague. And for a time the peasants were satisfied. But as the plague continued, and grew even worse, the peasants again rose against the Jews. They cried, The Jews are an unclean people. They have strange ways, they have strange ways of burial. Even their dead are unclean. Their dead lie festering in the ground, and bring the plague upon us. An old man among the peasants, known for his wizardry, stirred them up, saying, I know a cure for the plague. Come with me at night, to the graveyard of the Jews. All who come, bring spades. That night the peasants lighted torches. In the marketplace that was in the center of their town they, P. 34, built a great pile of wood, and made it ready for burning. Then they chose ten men amongst them, and sent them with the wizard to the cemetery of the Jews. Where is the holiest of their graves? Said the wizard. No one knew. Then they went and seized the keeper of the cemetery, and they dragged him into the graveyard. Where is the holiest of your graves? They cried. Tell, or you yourself will be used to light the pyre. 
they brandished their torches over his head. The Jew was frightened, he ran in terror and threw himself down on the grave of the Rebetzin. Save me, holy Rebetzin. He cried. The peasants threw him aside. And they placed themselves around the grave of the Rebetzin, and began to dig. At first, she became restless at the sound of their digging. She stirred in her coffin. But she thought, perhaps they are digging another grave nearby. But as the digging came closer to her coffin, and she felt the tight earth above her loosen, she became frightened, and wondered what was happening. Suddenly a spade struck upon her coffin. Then she remembered, and cried out loud, Rabbi Israel. In the morning, the wizard and all his followers were found lying dead upon her grave. After the master of the holy name had revealed his power to the Rebetzin, he did not remain long in her house. He decided that he would go and claim his wife. Then, changing his rabbinical garments for he 35. The short jacket and heavy boots of a peasant, Israel started out on foot for food. He came to the city, and went directly to the house of Rabbi Gershon. Rabbi Gershon was deep in study over a difficult problem in the Torah, and he did not notice that a man had come into the room. But when he had finished reading he looked up and saw that a peasant was standing there. He was not pleased with the man. He cried out, What do you want? Rabbi Israel, speaking gruffly like a peasant, said, I have come to take my wife. Who is your wife? Who are you? Your sister is my wife. I am Israel, son of Eliezer. How can it be that my father pledged my sister to a peasant? Thought Rabbi Gershon. She could marry into the richest of families, or she could be wedded to the most celebrated of rabbis. Yet he did not wish to distrust the wisdom of his dead father. He looked upon Israel, and asked him, What is your profession? I am a lime burner. I work in the hills. No. Cried Rabbi Gershon. It cannot be that you are the man. Rabbi Israel showed him the contract. Then Rabbi Gershon called his sister. Here is the man to whom your father betrothed you, he said. You see that he is a peasant, an ignorant lime burner. It cannot be that your holy father betrothed you to an ignorant boor. Let us send him out of the house. But the girl said, My father made a marriage contract for me, and I will keep it. I cannot have a peasant in this house, said Rabbi. P. 36. Paragraph continues Gershon. Break the contract. I will pay him money, and he will go away. Israel said, I have come for my wife, not for money. Break the contract, said Rabbi Gershon, or marry him and go out of the house. I will marry him and go away with him, said the woman. Israel took his wife with him high into the Carpathians. Near the village of Zabi he built a cabin for them to live in. He worked as a lime burner, and his wife helped him. Thus they earned a scant livelihood. But sometimes Israel would take dry bread in a sack, and go away into the hills. He would remain by himself all week long. Before the Sabbath he would return home. He would remain at home during the Sabbath, and during the following week again take bread and wander among the high hills, contemplating God. In those mountains, too, there were many robbers. They had their forts in the forests, and they sallied out in bands to attack wealthy travelers on the roads. Once, hidden among the trees, a number of these bandits saw the form of a man who walked on the ledge of a mountain peak. A chasm lay between the cliff he walked upon and the next mountain. The man seemed absorbed in thought. He did not look where he walked. He will surely walk off the cliff. He will fall into the chasm. The bandits cried to one another. They could not move, but watched him. P. 37 to enlarge the peasant's bride. P. 38. Then they saw the two mountains move together, and close the chasm between them. The master stepped safely from one peak to the other peak. And when he had passed, the mountains separated behind him, and were as they had been, with the chasm lying between them. When the robbers saw this happen they said one to another, He must be a holy man. Then they ran toward him and said, Be our judge. Rabbi Israel answered, If you will promise never to injure a Jew, I will be your judge. They agreed. I live in the cabin near Zabi, he said. When you need a judge to decide your quarrels, come to me. Once two of the thieves quarreled over the division of their spoils. They came to Rabbi Israel in his cabin and asked him to say which of them was in the right. Together, they had stopped a carriage. One of them had held the horses. The other had beaten a fat merchant and robbed him of his coffers. I nearly killed the merchant. He bragged. The better share of the money belongs to me. But his companion declared that the spoils should be evenly divided. The Baal Shem Tov said, the second man is right. The spoils should be evenly divided. The robbers accepted his decision, and returned to their fort. But the killer was not content. After he had given his companion half of the money and jewels, he felt. P. 39. Even more angry. When night came, he decided to revenge himself upon the Baal Shem Tov. He took his knife, 
and went out onto the mountain. He went through the forest, and came to the Baal Shem's cabin. He opened the door, and went into the room. He saw Rabbi Israel sleeping. The robber stood over the bed, and raised his knife to strike the sleeping rabbi. Suddenly the bandit was assaulted from behind. His arm was seized. He felt blows descent upon his shoulders. He was beaten with fists and with cudgels. He was beaten as by ten strong men, until he lay groaning on the ground. His head was covered with blood, and his body was blue with bruises. And still he saw no adversary. He thrust his arms wildly into the air, to catch up the bodies of those who were beating him. He tried to seize their sticks. He swung his arms all around him, but encountered only emptiness. And yet blows continued to descend upon him. Then he wrote out loud with pain. The Baal Shem Tov awoke. What is it? He asked. Who is shouting here? He looked, and saw the beaten highwayman, with his knife in his hand, lying on the ground. Then he knew what had happened. Rabbi Israel got out of his bed, and went and fetched water, and washed the robber's wounds. After having lived seven years in the Carpathians, Rabbi Israel and his wife returned to Rabbi Gershon in Kuth. Rabbi Gershon still believed that his brother-in-law was an ignorant present, and of no p. 40. Use in the world. He did not know what to do with him. At last he thought of a plan. Can you drive a carriage? He asked of Rabbi Israel. The Baal Shem said that he could drive. Often I have to go to the neighboring villages to render judgments of Torah. You will drive my wagon. So the Baal Shem Tov became a coachman for his brother-in-law. Once they went on a journey. When they had been riding for several hours, Rabbi Gershon fell asleep. Rabbi Israel was absorbed in contemplation, and forgot to guide the horse. The reins were slack in his hands. A bull came charging along the road. The horse was frightened. He jumped sidewise, and pulled the wagon into a ditch. Rabbi Gershon lay bruised in the mud. God has cursed me, he cried, with a brother-in-law who is good for nothing. He can't even drive a horse. Then Rabbi Gershon decided that he could not abide to have his brother-in-law living in the same village. What can I do with him? He thought. My sister will go with him wherever he goes. I cannot let them starve. At last he decided, I will set him up as a tavern keeper. So Rabbi Gershon inquired, and found that in a place named I Truck, near Caso, there was an inn that could be bought very cheaply. It was a poor sort of place, as few travelers passed on that road. Even an experienced tavern keeper could barely earn his bread there. P. 41. Rabbi Gershon rented the tavern, and gave it to his sister and his brother-in-law. There was very little to do in the tavern. But the spot was a beautiful spot, lonely and wild, covered with trees and crossed with running streams. Behind the house the master found a spring of water among a copse of trees. He set to work and carried stones, and built a miku around the spring. That purifying bath is there until this day. Near the mikvah he built a hut. When there were no people to serve in the tavern, he would retire to this hut, and remain there days long in meditation. When travelers came to the tavern, his wife would call his name, and he would come back to the house and serve his guests, make their beds for them, and bring them food and drink. And still no one knew who he was, for he kept his power hidden. Once Rabbi David of Klama, who was a friend of Rabbi Gershon, went through the country to gather gifts for the Chanukah feast. When Rabbi David came to Kuth, Rabbi Gershon said to him, If you pass near Kaso, go to my brother-in-law's tavern at Itruk, and stay with him. And on your return, tell me the news of my sister. Is your brother-in-law a learned man? Asked Rabbi David. He is an ignorant present, said Rabbi Gershon bitterly. Rabbi David came to the Baal Shem's tavern. Israel was not in the house, but was alone in his hut in the... P. 42. Woods. His wife called to him, crying. Israel, we have a rabbi for our guest. At once Israel ran into the house. He took a chicken, and killed it, and cooked it for Rabbi David. While Rabbi David ate supper, Israel went and made his bed. And all through the evening, while the visitor spoke to the woman of the wisdom and fame of the father and her brother, Rabbi Israel sat quietly behind the oven. At last Rabbi David went to sleep. Then Rabbi Israel took the Torah, and began to read. The Baal Shem Tov never slept more than two hours a night. Many nights he did not sleep at all remaining awake over the Torah. Now, as he pierced deeper and deeper into the pure realm of wonder, the darkness that was about him gave way, for light seemed to stream from Rabbi Israel. He did not have a lamp for his reading, he read by the illumination that hovered about him where he sat. And still the light grew, and glowed, and became bright as a bright flame. And Rabbi Israel sat in the midst of it. His soul was warmly bathed in the divine fire, his soul was filled with ecstasy. Suddenly Rev David awakened. He saw the flame in the corner of the room. He leaped from his bed. He ran to call the tavern keepers. But only Rabbi Israel's wife was in their bed. Rabbi David wakened her, shouting, Quick, the house is on fire. 
P. 43. But the Baal Shem's wife looked where there was light, and smiled and said, If you believe there is a fire, put it out. Reb David ran and got a pail of water and carried it to the oven. But as he was about to pour out the water, he saw Israel sitting there in the midst of the shining light, and he saw his ecstatic face. Rabbi David did not understand everything. But he knew that this was a holy man. He was silent. He set the pail down noiselessly. He crept back to his bed, and closed his eyes. But all night long he could not sleep. He saw before him the ecstatic face of the Baal Shem Tov, as he sat bathed in the light of heaven. When Rabbi David returned to Kut, he went to Rabbi Gershon and said, I stayed in the tavern of your brother-in-law. How is my sister? Asked Rabbi Gershon. She is well. And my brother-in-law, does he help her about the tavern? Rabbi David said, your brother-in-law is holier than you. Rabbi Gershon laughed. He can't even drive a horse, he said. Rabbi Israel and his wife could not earn a living at the tavern. Rabbi Gershon did not help them anymore. I will learn a simple way to earn a living, said Rabbi Israel. He went to trust, and worked for a P. 44. Butcher there, and learned to be a shocket. After that he returned with his wife to Brody, and became a shocket in Brody. When Rabbi Israel was 36 years old, the voice of God came to him and said, The time has come for you to reveal yourself. Then the master of the name began to perform works of wonder. The Golden Mountain, by Mayor Levin, 1932, at Sacred Texts. Com. Key. 45. The Bride in the Grave. A true story of how the Baal Shem Tov brought back a bride from the other world. Soon the whole world knew of the wisdom and power of the Baal Shem Tov. From all corners of the Carpathians, followers came to him. Often he went on journeys to far places to which the hill had called him. Once on a Wednesday night Rabbi Israel arose and said, I must go away for the Sabbath. He went into the barn and harnessed his horse. Several of his followers sprang after him and begged that he take them with him. But he allowed only a few of them to come into his wagon. Where will we hold Sabbath? They said. In Berlin, in the house of a wealthy Jew. Though they knew that with swiftest horses it took more than a week to reach Berlin, they did not question the rabbi, for the master was not confined in the bonds of time or of space. The Baal Shem let his little horse walk slowly along a byway all that evening, and at midnight the wagon stopped before a tavern. Let us stay here tonight, said Rabbi Israel. The tavern keeper welcomed them into his house, for he saw that they were holy men. Perhaps you will honor my house, and remain over Sabbath? He said. But Rabbi Israel answered, we must hold Sabbath in Berlin. The innkeeper looked at him, and did not understand. The rabbi said, on Sabbath Eve there is two. He. 46. Be a wedding in the house of a wealthy Jew of Berlin, and I must be at the wedding in order to read the service, and bless the bride. You must have a wonderful horse, said the tavern keeper, smiling. My little horse will get me there in time, said Rabbi Israel. In time for the Sabbath after this one, answered the innkeeper, laughing. Why, Berlin is farther than a hundred miles away. If you were to travel day and night, sparing neither man nor beast, you might arrive in time for the Sabbath after this one. But his words did not trouble the Baal Shem Tov. Rabbi Israel turned to his followers and said, You are tired. Let us go to sleep. The tavern keeper could not sleep at night. He lay awake wondering how the rabbi would reach Berlin before the Sabbath day. This is Wednesday night, he said. Tomorrow is a day, and Friday is only part of the day. No, I cannot understand it. At last he said to himself, I will know I have things to attend to in Berlin, and ask him to take me there. When the Baal Shem Tov arose in the morning, the tavern keeper ran to him saying, Shall I harness the horse, Rabbi? Not yet, said the Baal Shem Tov. First we will pray. And after that, we will eat our breakfast. Rabbi, said the innkeeper, I have business to do in Berlin. Take me there with you. When we start, come with us in our wagon, said Rabbi Israel. P. 47. The master and his followers said the morning prayers, and after that they sat down around the table. They ate without haste, and while they ate they discussed the Torah. A problem of judgment arose, and they sat a long time discussing the problem. Meanwhile the innkeeper ran and dressed himself for the journey. When he was ready, he looked into the room where the master sat with his students, and he saw them still absorbed in their discussions. Half a day is gone already, thought the innkeeper. He heard Rabbi Israel's words. Of every good deed we do, a good angel is born. Of every bad deed, a bad angel is born. In all the deeds of our daily life we serve God as directly as though our deeds were prayers. When we eat, when we work, when we sing, when we wash ourselves, we are praying to God. Therefore we should live constantly in highest joy, for everything that we do is an offer to God. 
and of those things that we do badly, work that we leave half finished, or thoughts that we leave uncompleted, malformed angels are born. Angels without heads, angels with no eyes, angels without arms, without hair, without feet. Therefore no deed should be left unfinished. The innkeeper thought, if that is the way he travels to Berlin, the angel born of his ride will have perhaps the beginning of a toe, and nothing else. But the rabbi and his students remained around the table, talking. I will tell you the story of a king, said the Baal Shem Tov. There was a very wise king who had built for himself a strange and wonderful palace. In P. 48. The center of the palace was a room in which stood the throne. Only one door led into this room. All through the palace were passageways and halls and corridors that turned and twisted about and led in every direction. There were endless walls without openings, and there were more corridors and more passageways. When the palace stood finished, the king sent an order to all of his lords commanding them to come before him. He sat on his throne and waited. The lords came to the outside of the palace, and stared in wonder at the confusion of corridors. They said, there is no way to come to the king. But the prince threw open the door saying, here he sits before you. Always lead to the king. Then Rabbi Israel added, so we may find God. In the afternoon, the Baal Shem Tov called the tavern keeper. I will harness the horse at once, said the tavern keeper. No, not yet. First, we will eat the evening meal. Then the rabbi and his students sat down again, and ate largely and well. As evening came, the rabbi himself went to the barn and harnessed the horse to the wagon. Now we will go, he said. The innkeeper got into the wagon with them. At last I will see what manner of horse he has here, he thought. And he bound his cloth around his throat, for he thought, a great wind will come because of our swift riding. The little horse began to walk. At first, the tavern keeper. P. 49. Saw, they were going along the same road on which his tavern stood. Every house along the way he knew, and every tree. But as the darkness grew like sleep around his eyes, he was no longer sure where he rode. First, there seemed to be no more houses. Then there seemed to be no more people. And at last, there seemed to be no more trees. He was awake, he listened, and yet he could not distinguish the hoofbeats of the horse. The wagon moved silently through the darkness, smoothly as if floating on a surface of glass. The air was tender about his face, and there was a sweet odor in his nostrils. He thought to himself, perhaps I am not here at all. Then he felt the chisit who sat next to him, in order to make sure that this was no vision. Where are we going? He said. We are going to Berlin. But I do not recognize the road. The Baal Shem Tov said, this is a short way. All night long they rode, and the tavern keeper saw no light of habitation.